Richard Roberts here, and what we are going to talk you through here is a very interesting little compilation film of early cinema from the early 1950s called Yesterday and Today. Produced and distributed by Mr. Abner J. Greshner, who was, in fact, Martin and Lewis's agent, uh, which was a pretty good thing to be in the uh, early 50s, and I think he made a nice chunk of change that he was trying to find some tax shelters for, so he got into the motion picture distribution business, and uh, this was one of his films. has some pretty impressive uh, credits, including Stanley Cortez, who only photographed the uh, <laughs> Georgie Jessel footage, which was done at the Howard Roach Studios probably in a day, but uh, what the heck. Uh, you know, it's not The Magnificent Amberson, but it was uh, a day's work. What the heck. What this film actually is, is a compilation of two earlier British compilations. It's a compilation of compilations, basically. Yeah, that sounds dirty. Uh, <laughs> entitled Return Fair to Laughter, and those were the days. It were produced by uh, Butcher's Film Service. And, uh, like I said... Uh, Greshner had been distributing some other uh, British film product in the early 50s, including some pretty good stuff. Things like The 100 Hour Hunt with Jack Warner, which was a nice little uh, police procedural. Uh, Greshner just made some odd things, including later he produced a film version of Uncle Vanya, which is actually available from VCI uh, at the moment. And uh, but but these two compilations of early cinema came, uh, the, especially Return for the Laughter was produced by a guy named Henry Fisher, who was a British film collector and a lot of rare early and very interesting uh, footage, uh, which we are going to see. the The only problem with it is, in both the uh, Butcher's Film Service versions of these compilations and this version <laughs> of these compilations, they managed to pretty much get. Everything misidentified and everything wrong. And we can't even really blame this guy. Good old Mr. Jessel. Uh, Georgie, Georgie Jessel, eh? Georgie Jessel, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Get Charlie Callison here. He can do that better than I can. Uh, okay, explain this to me. I've been a film historian now for nearly 50 years. <laughs> One of the things I cannot explain is this man's career. <laughs> I mean, George Jessel was around forever. Uh, my goodness, he can't even read a cue card correctly, as we can see here. It, 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 it's off to the to the right. It should be off to the left of camera. But I mean, my goodness, what was this man's reason for a career? <laughs> you know, he's more famous for Charlie Callis's impersonation of him for crying out loud. Yes, I guess he was a a somewhat of a Broadway legend, uh, around the time of Al Jolson and Eddie Cantor, and you know, in the teens. And, and yes, he was the star of the Broadway version of the jazz singer and turned down the film version, which something I think he, he, he never, ever forgot or got over. After that, what? What? What did he do? I mean, I mean, you know, Hollywood's, what was it? Hollywood's greatest Toastmaster and famous for eulogizing and uh, some such, you know, just showing up at after dinner speaking or funerals. In fact, we all know the famous story, don't we? You know, the, the famous old star in the hospital on his deathbed you know, calls to his son sitting next to the bed, you know, to, to, to come closer from under the oxygen tent. The son, thinking he's going to hear the, the great man's last words, comes closer and the man grabs him by the shirt and says, Not Jessel! Anyway, what was the deal with the devil? I mean, this man was still playing Vegas in the 70s, for crying out loud. I don't think anyone was going to see him, but he was still playing. He was a film producer, by the way, for a while, 20th Century Fox. In fact, I think he still was at about the time he did this. Made a few good movies, Nightmare Alley, uh, The Dolly Sisters, uh, Wait Till the Sun Shines, Nelly. One of my favorites, Anne of the Indies, which is the one with uh, Howard Hughes, what, what name? Gene Peters, uh, as, a, as a pirate girl. Yeah, I mean... Okay, not a bad battle career. He obviously <laughs> made a lot of money and could afford to, to show up on talk shows and things like that. But anyway, that's Jessel. He's in this. He's introducing it. Like I said, one day at the Howe Road Studios, he's got Marilyn Monroe on his desk. The only way she's going to show up in this picture, you know, a little still picture of him with her on there. Eh, enough. What we're seeing here, this is... Uh, this is actually taken out of a lot of it out of return fair to laughter uh just shots of old cameras the black mariah 
etc. Cetera, et cetera. I guess that's Winston Churchill on the uh, on the left next to Jessalair. I'll leave it to you guys to figure out who it is in the back. But uh, anyway, yeah, the, most like I said, all of these all of these little uh, insert shots, the words mutoscope, avivascope, etc. All of that. Uh, comes right out of Return Fair to Laughter. But like I said, the British versions of these compilations manage to misidentify everything pretty much <laughs> as much as they do here. Now, that said, there's some incredibly rare footage that we are about to see. And what we've managed to do, you know, it, and it always turns out this way. Kit Parker calls and says, "Hey, Richard, will you do us a will you do us a uh, commentary track for something?" I'll throw this together. This ended up being a big research adventure, which went on for six to eight weeks, as uh, we madly figured out and tracked down what most of these film clips that we are about to see really are. <laughs> so, uh, you're welcome. Uh, we hope this uh, this brings a little more. Uh, you know, enlightenment to these uh, these films. Uh, and like I said, there's some very rare and unique footage here, some of which may only exist in this form at this point. What we're seeing now is some early newsreel footage, and uh, actually, Jessel identifies most of these people correctly. Like I said, from what I can tell, these, these are right. Uh, King Ferdinand, I think, of Bulgaria, there. They're all guys in medals and uniforms, what the heck. Emperor France, Joseph, Austria, Hungary. All good newsreel footage of the period. Tsar Nicholas, I think. And I think this is King George and the Premier of France, like, like they said. I said I'm the film guy. These are the these are the history people. You know, but but from what we could determine, these the these are all uh, basically from around 1910, 1912. Perhaps this perhaps just a hair later. Prince of Wales of the time. Later the Duke of Windsor. Here's Andrew Carnegie. I don't know how rich guys get away with looking like derelicts, but they do. And of course. Here's Teddy, a progressive candidate, a progressive politician in office who was actually a Republican. You don't see that much anymore. Woodrow Wilson, our peace-loving president who got us into World War I. Yeah, you got to love him. He was also a big fan of the birth of the nation, as I recall. Now George is going to show us some fashion stuff. This is taken from God knows what, all sorts of newsreel things. Like I said, a lot of this out of the Henry Fisher collection, which now I believe resides at the BFI. It, it actually was in Germany for a while. Um, so just mostly odd fashion films. Again, appears to be from about the early teens, early to early pre-World War II. This clip appears to have been hand-tinted at... Uh, some point, of course, only existing now in black and white. Sadly, I think there's a number of films that we're going to see, especially there's a lot of films from Path A that were probably originally hand tinted, uh, that uh, at least in this form. Yeah, you can see there the leaves above the uh, the cave that the women are coming out of, and uh, you can see around yeah around the leaves of the gal standing here. An awful lot of fashion footage was part of newsreels. Uh, some of this may even be... There's Kinemacolor footage. Kinemacolor was a British company. They were very into photographing fashions at the time. You can always tell their stuff because it has sort of a, a flicker to it. Jessel is really mean about some of the women's looks. Like, he should talk. Yeah, I know. He was married to Norma Talmadge for a while, so we do have to cut him some slack. But, uh... <laughs> yeah. Like, I think this is very uncalled for. This, this poor woman who... who freeze frame. It's actually not bad, especially for, for 19, whatever. <laughs> for 19, 15, 16. When swimsuits were also somewhat daring, but now as George continues to 
do a bad job of reading the cue cards. We get into uh, the actual film footage, uh, some clips of some very rare, interesting stuff. This one, which, of course, he calls sneezing powder and says from 1899, nope, wrong This is, in fact, That Fatal Sneeze, a rather famous uh, Cecil Hepworth film, released June of 1907, directed by Louis Fitzhamon, who was one of uh, Cecil Hepworth's most uh, prolific directors, especially in this early period. This is a fun little gag comedy. Thurston Harris playing the uncle here. And the uh, nephew who put the sneezing powder in is actually Gertie Potter, uh, a, a girl, apparently, uh, pretending to be a guy. And Fritz are always into that. Uh, a very popular trick comedy. I mean, there were a zillion trick and chase comedies. This was started by the French. But this is a good one. It's got some great little special effects. Of course, this, this thing here where he's sneezing and causing the earthquake. Uh, there's some, there's some you know, nice British, you know, muddy Python-esque imagination being thrown into this here. Uh, it, 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 the Brits always have a wonderful sense of humor. Which, uh, of course, when, when uh, Americans stole a lot of their music hall comics, people like Chaplin, and uh, all, you know, the, 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 always call it the first British invasion. When the British comics came over uh, for music hall and uh, worked at Keystone and elsewhere. Uh, but we still, you know, we still had the British sense of humor in British films as well. And there are some some great. That's a nicely set up shot, especially considering everybody there. Had to have their hats on wires. Now, this is a French chase film. All righty. It's one of the many. We didn't ID it. Any of you bright boys out there who want to go figure out which, you know, French chase film involving a motor car this is, you go ahead and then, you know, write your Uncle Richard and, and let him know. But, uh, like I said, the chase films started you know, about 1903, 1904, and they became endless all through all through the, the, the aughts. Uh, the French did them, the British did them, then of course the Americans, uh, D.W. Griffith stole it with a curtain pole and Max in it, uh, took it to another whole new level, but it was basically an, an imitation by that time. But uh, even from the beginning of cinema, audiences loved seeing property destroyed and people beaten to a pulp, uh, especially the French, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Anyhow, a fun film. Now, this one, the next up, old Georgie misidentifies as The Living Head, which uh, it is not, in fact. Although it is, I think, actually the earliest film that we are going to see. This is, in fact, a Georges Méliès film, French, uh, from 1899. Star Films released this, 1899. It was actually called The Mysterious Blackboard. Or the mysterious knight, Le Chevalier Mysterieux, and uh, very early Melier's trick film. Of course, Georges Melier was the pioneer of trick photography. Uh, even by 1899, he had been producing films for three years at this point. But uh, and that is in fact him playing the mysterious knight. And uh, this film can of course be seen uh, on a marvelous set that came out from Fucker Alley. But at this point, this was a, a rare glimpse of, uh, of Melies this early. Now this film, again, The Professor's Mistake is what Jessel called it. Not even close. This isn't even a French film. If you notice the American Vitagraph logo sitting on the back of The Professor's set, this is in fact liquid electricity, or the inventor's galvanic fluid, produced by the Vitagraph Company of America, released September 7th, 1907, one of J. Stuart Blackton's great early trick films. Uh, a lot of fun. Uh, basically, this professor liquefies electricity, and when he sprays it on himself, it speeds him up, and uh, he then goes on and outside and does it to other people. <laughs> uh, fun, fun and imaginative, and... Uh, J. Stuart Blackman was doing a number of those in America at the time. And a, a good film. Now, this is this is an interesting... These Jules Verne things, again, these clips come right out of Return Fair to Laughter. And Jessel is you know, talking about Jules Verne. And then we, we go to a film here which he calls Little Jimmy's Nightmare. Well, 
it in fact is not Little Jimmy's Nightmare. Even though Jessel said it's a famous early film, it, it is in fact tying in perfectly with Jules Verne. This is La Petite Jules Verne, a little Jules Verne Pathé picture made in 1907. Not 1905 as is listed in the AFI catalog. It was actually 1907. Directed by Gaston Vellier. I, I'm probably mangling all the French. Just get over it now. Um, a a Pathé trick film. And, and again, this one kind of stumped everybody for a while, but you know, the Jules Verne angle is perfect because little Jimmy goes off in a balloon in an airship and uh, sails over the city and in just a second he's going to plunge 20,000 leagues under the sea. Oh, looks like it was probably a hand-tinted print. Well, in fact, there is a beautiful hand-tinted print of this at the Library of Congress. Uh, so th this scene with, of course, all the French babe dancers are probably moonlighting from the uh, Follies Bergère are uh, dancing and showing off here for uh, for little Jimmy or little Jules Verne or whatever the heck his, uh, <laughs> his name is. Uh, very hard to find actors uh, for the you know, real names for a lot of these early films. But, uh, oh, and there's the octopus, just as it's in 20... It's actually in 20,000 Leagues or it's just in the film. I think it's in the film. And then we have the... Uh, him having a pillow fight with himself, which, if I really want to be pretentious, I can say influenced Abel Gans's scene in Napoleon years later. Probably not. Now, this one, Jessel gets half right. He credits this as Pathé's version of A Trip to the Moon, which it indeed is. However similar it looks, this is not the 1902 Georges Méliès version. This is, in fact, the 1908 Pathé remake of Melier's Trip to the Moon, directed by Segundo de Chaumont, who uh, I believe was Brazilian, but uh, was actually started, I believe, as a cameraman and doing special effects at Pathé about 1905, and then uh, became basically there, Georges Melier's doing some wonderful uh, trick films. Um, this, this one, basically, in some ways, kind of outdoes the Amelia's version. I like the fact that here we have we have the moon. <laughs> just like just like we do in the Amelia's version, but doesn't hit him in the eye. Goes plunk right into his mouth there and uh, breathes a bit of fire. But that's this version again, a, a beautiful hand turned version now exists that I believe is out there on DVD to look at. Now this film uh, which you know, again, Jessel's sort of right. It's an early crime film. In fact, it's a very popular uh, 1907 Pathé uh, French crime film. Uh, the title in French, Les Chiens de Police. Or de Police. Ah, I'm not going to sound like Michel Valley. Anyway, it's Police Dogs. Uh, written by Andre Huse. I'm not sure who directed it, but it starts off with some, some wonderful fighting here. I actually think... Andre Deed may be playing, who was one of the early French comics, maybe playing one of the criminals here. We'll point him out in a second. I could be wrong on that. that that's, that's just a judgment call. But this fellow in front here looks, who just sat down at, at the bar, looks a bit like Andre Deed. And uh, we have not yet seen the police dogs. They, they will be coming. Dogs, e beginning of films. <laughs> they understood. <laughs> You know, put a dog in the picture, people are going to love it. Again, Cecil, Cecil Hepworth in Britain did Rescued by Rover in 1905, which became one of the most popular international pictures. So, hey, Pathé had already made a number of Shin chase films. And uh, with the dogs not always working for the good guys sometimes. Uh, I think there's one called Shin's Smugglers. Here they are. An interesting ragtag group. I guess the German Shepherd had not taken over as the police dog type, but here they are, checking, checking the evidence, getting the scent, and off they go. Somewhat slightly out of control. Where we now have yet another chase. <laughs> the the, <laughs> the backbone of the industry. And uh, these dogs are not going to be not going to be stopped. Like I said, not sure who directed this. Could be Ferdinand Zecca, could be Albert Capilani, who were two of Pathé's big directors at the time. But it is true. P 
Cathay was leading basically the world film industry at this point uh, before World War One. Uh, I mean, these films were popular all over the world. They were, they were being released in America. They were being released in Britain. Um, certainly popular in France. Uh, and as, as again, all of these prints most likely were originally British release prints I said, that, that Henry Fisher uh, collected or put together. And uh, they, like I said, they really were leading the industry. Now, the American film industry, the Patents Trust, all pretty much tried to stop that around 1910. Really, they did what they could to sort of break Pathé's stronghold on uh, on the American distribution market. But uh, but they were also really good quality films. I mean, I think the, the Pathé trick films that survived seem to be even better than it, technically in a lot of the Melies films. Now. Talk about from the beginning of the Hollywood industry. This this film actually apparently is called The Bride Retires. At least that's how it's known. Release date a little sketchy. Probably path A. But again showing nothing changes in the movie industry or in any other. Guarantee you, the minute any form of media was created, somebody figured out a way to do dirty stuff with it. Uh, let's face it. <laughs> you know, uh, there... Pornographic, pornographic still photographs from the invention of the camera. Pornographic cylinder recordings produced by Edison starting in the late 1890s. The minute we get a camera, we do, you know, especially when films starting in the peep shows, hey, what do we get? Actually, got to give the gal credit for, a, for, an early, for an early aughts French babe. And this is probably 1902, 19, between 19 to 19.5, but she's actually not bad looking. Yeah, not, not bad. Got a nice figure there. But, again, this film probably seen far more in things like Smokers than uh, in uh, the legitimate uh, Nickelodeons or, you know, vaudeville houses or wherever else the film was shown. Definitely shows you, you know, how much, how much effort it took to get undressed in those days. What have we got? We've got, uh, definitely got a corset. We've got... We've got Several, several pantaloons, several levels of, of underwear. Oh my God, we almost have. Well, we have a stockinged leg. But uh, yeah, not not bad looking for for that period. Usually they're they're all a little on the heftier side, and I have no idea how they breathed in those things. But again, the irony: she gets undressed, and she's actually almost more covered than she was. But anyway, don't get too excited, guys. You know. Some of the film nerds out there are you know, a little desperate. No, take anything, but uh, don't know who the guy is. Probably not too many people looked at him anyway. Kind of a thankless part in this. Playing the voyeur. Remember, that is a French word. And then he leaves. And then he leaves. Ah, what can you say? Well, we're going to see a couple of short comedy clips. Now we're getting into some comedy stuff and there was some great, great European comics. A whole generation of European and, and even some American comics. We're going to start, of course, with an American comic here. John Bunny. And this is a clip from a film called Chumps. A fairy story for overgrown-ups. Vitagraph, released January 16, 1912. The lady is Leah Baird. Uh, I don't believe this film actually exists in complete form. Now we're seeing Max Linder, who of course was probably the biggest of the European comics uh, starring in, in films from the 1900s into the teens. This film is Un Mariage a Puzzle. The Puzzle of Marriage? Marriage is a Puzzle? I don't know. Pathé, released September 24th, 1910. Rare Linder comedy. I'm not sure this actually does exist in other forms. Uh, but Max Linder, again, very, very popular comedy star. Real name... Gabriel Maximilien Louvier, uh, been an actor on the French stage, got into motion pictures, first uh, d d joining Pathé around 1905, doing uh, dramatic roles and uh, bit parts and sorts of things. Uh, started doing comedies 1906-1907 uh, when Pathé's popular, really popular comic Andre Deed um, left 
Path A in 1908, Linder was essentially put into uh, the role of the lead comic, which uh, very quickly, because he he had this very, very sort of, instead of playing a lower class person, he was a boulevardier, a uh, high class top hatted, you know, nicely dressed comic and it's middle class bourgeois values here like the way they're fooling dad be very popular all through the, the teens sadly committed suicide in 1925 about this time the italians are making great progress with moving pictures now here's one starring tontolini he was a famous italian comic you know this was the age of the mother-in-law jokes everybody's mother-in-law was a villain now we're seeing uh, Fernando Guillaume, who was uh, known around the world under his comic monikers, Tonsolini Polidor, I think he was also known as Fool's Head, perhaps, in uh, England. But real name, Fernando Guillaume, born May 19, 1887, in Bayonne, France. Died December 3, 1977, at the age of 90, in Viareggio Luca, Italy. A very popular early comic. And uh, this film is, in fact, uh, Polidor contro la sua sera, uh, which translates into Polidor against his mother-in-law. And you'd believe it, she looks like Sid Chaplin from Charlie's Aunt there. Uh, this is an Italian picture, Pasquale Cinema, uh, Cinema, whatever, um, greedy accents, released August of 1912. Now... <laughs> This is a wonderful <laughs> little black comedy. I mean, I love love the way he's planning to just to just off uh, mother-in-law here, even if he fails. It's like, you know, nobody ever liked mother-in-laws. Now, he worked uh, for quite a while, Guillaume. In fact, um, after doing you know, the, the, all of these uh, Tontolini, Polidor, whatever uh, comedies in the... Uh, you know, about 1909 into the uh, the mid-teens, basically the war, uh, he continued to work in film, I guess worked in stage, and then even late in life appears in quite a number of Fellini's 60s films like La Dolce Vita, Eight and a Half, and Spirits of the Dead, and some of the others. But uh, a, ni a nice look up, showing the early comedies can be extremely black and very funny. Like I said, this is a, still a very untapped area of research, all of the, the, the great European comics of the period. And we'll, we'll see some more of it. Now we're going to see. This was another one that, uh, sadly, everybody uh, in, in either version of this compilation and poor Georgie here gets completely wrong. Uh except for the fact that, that he does explain that it's an Edison picture, but it's not Asleep at the Switch. It is, in fact, the President's Special, released by Edison February 15th of 1910. Uh, and this, this actor here is William Bechtel, who was actually a German actor who worked in quite a number of Edison pictures. His wife is Laura Sawyer, who was another one of Edison's uh, early big stars. Bechtel, again, came from... German stage uh, worked as a comedian, I believe, much more than a dramatic actor. But here he's uh, definitely in the uh, doing a bit of the expressionist acting and the trying to stay awake. I, th I think he may have actually stapled his eyelids open, as we'll see later. Laura Sawyer. Uh, was an Edison actress from 1908 until 1913. Uh, uh, one of their more popular stars, a favorite of Edison director J. Searle Dolly, who may have directed the present special, maybe not, actually not completely sure, but she worked at Edison until 1913, then followed J. Searle Dolly all the way to famous players. Lasky went along with him again when he formed the Dirita Art Film Company in 1916, <laughs> worked with him in, in most of his pictures, co-wrote one of them, The Valentine Girl, and then Oddly retires from the industry uh, when Dolly marries Grace Manville Owens in 1918. I wonder if there's a connection. She, uh, she died September 7, 1970 in Matawan, New Jersey. Now here, Mr. Bechtel 
is getting some creepy. This is this is somewhat Germanic and very interesting. I said this asleep at the switch concept was a very popular one at Edison. In fact, uh, made, they did make a picture, I believe, called Sleep of the Switch. Later sort of remade it as The Phantom Signal, a 1913 two-reeler, one of the early films directed by John Collins. I like this. He's being haunted by the ghosts of his you know, victims. Again, like I said, uh, definitely go, going for the ping-pong ball eyes there. But uh, Bechtel, again, very busy in the industry. Uh, born in Berlin, uh, 12th of June, 1867. Died in Hollywood, October 27, 1930, but continued to work pretty steadily through the teens, uh, even somewhat in the 20s. I think he, he also did some uh, uh, some stage acting. More recent films you might remember. I mean, he actually plays a character in Buster Keaton's Spike Marriage, Nussbaum. I think, uh, as I remember, that's either, either I, that's the tailor that I think Buster works for, and that's just the year before he died. But uh, this is getting very Conrad Veidt like Ah, there he goes. But Laura's going to save the day. Train films again, another one. He, <laughs> well, from before the great train robbery, onward. Uh, <laughs> we were always, uh, the train movies were, were very popular in this race to the last minute. It's probably, I wonder if that's the Lackawanna Railroad again. That's the one that uh, Edison used a lot out there in New Jersey, where of course this was shot. But a happy ending here as uh, Mr. Bechtel's not haunted by his victims, but is in fact woken up by them. He just finally is getting some sleep and they have to wake him up and congratulate the poor guy again. But I think he'll He'll feel a little better now. Like I said, I, I think this may be the, the only print of this, the only place this film uh, can be seen is in uh, this compilation. So anyway, enough spooky. Let's go back to a little, a little more comedy. This is another one of the early European comics. Little Moritz. Moritz Schwartz. Very funny. Uh, and this, uh, this film was called Little Moritz Se Fait Les Moselles. Translates Little Moritz Builds Up His Muscles. Uh, Pathé Frere is released in 1911. And uh, probably directed by Romeo Bozzetti, who was Pathé's main comedy director, really running their comedy unit in uh, the early teens. And this film's great. I mean, this is really funny. <laughs> Just the, this uh, this destruction all in the name of exercise, which, uh, I mean, how many times have we seen this? But, but certainly, this is, I love how every, everybody in the room with him keeps making the same moves. And apparently walls in France weren't, uh, weren't any thicker then uh, than they are now. Now, not a lot is known about Marit Schwartz. And, uh, he is not, by the way, as the IMDb says, Marie Schwartz, who uh, was Ukrainian-born and founded the Yiddish Art Theater and uh, directed the, the great Yiddish film version of Tevye, which is on the uh, National Film Registry. That's not this guy. <laughs> the guy here making the floors bounce up and down is Moritz Schwartz, who uh, was apparently a French comedian who uh, made, you know, made a, a number of Little Moritz films, 1910 to about 1912 or 13, and uh, not much heard from him after that. But uh, but these are fun, even though you know, tall guy abuse, uh, I being six foot eight, I take a little, little personally, but uh, in any event, <laughs> the floors are no stronger. He's going to destroy this house. You never see... You know, Richard Simmons uh, pulling walls down or something like that. But, uh, but a silly little film. A lot of, a lot of, the, a lot of the little Moritz films tend to do with him being a little guy conquering you know, people much larger than him. And uh, as he is about to sweep the floor here with, uh, with this poor tall guy. Whoa! who at least soon in, in the real tradition of silent comedy becomes a dummy, which uh, Moritz can then uh, completely throw around. There's always that little jump cut, and yes, there he goes. 
I always think that's funny. I, 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 it, well, it looks like a dummy. Yeah, get over it. Well, I said, all of these comics, and there were many, many more, uh, really definitely deserve to be rediscovered. Now, how far off the mark can George get? This, this is probably really as far off the mark as he goes. Yeah, he's telling us here that, that we're about to see one of the first of the Russian pictures. Well, sorry, George, it ain't a Russian picture. <laughs> it is, in fact, <laughs> another French film. Cabriolet Sentimental. The Sentimental Burglar, Pathé, released June of 1909. Uh, I don't know why they think it's a Russian film. I, I, don't, think, I don't think the Russians were into plaids and checks. But uh, this, this Apache, played by a nameless actor, has obviously a real bad fashion sense. But, uh, but again, this actually is a nice, a nice little drama. This is almost something, you know, I, th I think you might almost say the French are being, well, maybe a little too early, a little too early to be influenced by D.W. Griffith. But there was just a, a genre of early French films that were basically very social-minded. Um, a lot of them directed by Ferdinand Zecca or Albert Capilani at Pathé, who may have directed this for all we know. We don't really, could not find a credited director. But uh, here the uh, burglar with the bad fashion sense is about to be discovered by the little girl and her extremely large doll. Up, up, up! Is she in danger? He's gonna take her out. It was a, it was a modern day film. He might take, her, or a Sergio Leone film. He might take her out. But no, the film is called Sentimental Burglar, for a reason. <laughs> and uh, he's he's a sucker. He, is he a sucker for dolls? Uh, we're not sure. But uh, but like I said, there were a lot of, of social injustice films uh, being made in this period, and. Uh, I think perhaps this one a little more, again, sentimental than, uh, than the others. But, well, it's a nice, a nice little tracking shot there. I think this might have fooled some people not thinking it was a French film because the sets are actually pretty spare. You notice, you look at the Max Linders or the, you know, or, or a lot of the French films this period, and. Uh, <laughs> You know the living room sets, the the parlor sets, very cluttered with stuff. I mean, it's a little too austere looking. Probably just means this was a real low budget film that they shot very quickly. Lots of long shots. Oh, a foreground, a foreground uh, set piece there, but uh, yeah, the furniture does look French though. He takes the oh. He's, he's had a pang of consciousness. Off he goes. To find, a, to find a house that doesn't have a little kid in it that he can burglarize? No. He goes home and remembers he has a child too. And the family starves to death. Anyway, this next one was one of our big stumpers. I, I, I will not name names, but this, this film stumped any number of historians who <laughs> it was shown to in trying to figure out what it was. Jessel says it's a British picture. Uh, so does refer, Return Fair to Laughter, actually. And it, it's set during the Sepoy Rebellion of 1857, a very famous uh, British battle when the, uh, the Indians had an uprising against uh, the British because they did not want to sh they did not want to use bullets that were covered in pig fat, which they believed they were, which apparently they actually weren't. Uh, it does sort of look British, I guess, uh, to the untrained eye, especially the fact that all of the desert sets are in a rock quarry, which for anyone who watches Doctor Who understands, you, you have a desolate planet or a desert set in Britain, you go to the rock quarry. But I will admit, I watched this film several times, and each time I watched it, I said, this doesn't feel British. Finally, I sat down and looked at it basically frame by frame, trying to figure out why don't I think this is British, and finally came to a couple of reasons. One, the actors look too healthy and robust. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's true. They, they look like Americans. Uh, they have all their teeth. They have their hair. The women's clothing 
is sort of American, uh, you know, dress clothes. The uniforms are wrong, completely wrong. And, and if you compare this film to a film we're going to see in a little while, Muggins VC, you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. The pants don't match to begin with, and those epaulets belong on a Roxy Usher, <laughs> not, not a British soldier from the 1850s. Uh, so again, I'm going, somehow this does not, you know, this doesn't feel British. And this was the clincher, Pinto Pony. That's an American breed, not a British breed. It's an American film. Started digging in that direction, and yes, this turned out to be The Last Cartridge, an incident of the Sepoy Rebellion <laughs> produced by American Vitagraph, released at the end of January 1908. It is an American film. Amazingly, uh, based on an incident that I doubt that many Americans were familiar with uh, at the time. Perhaps, perhaps they were. Uh, but but rather odd. Now, a genuine British film, Muggins VC. And as I said, <laughs> just compare this one to the film we just saw. This is one they got right, partially because it's a very famous early British film, Cricks and Martin, production from 1909, directed by Dave Aylott. Uh, Arthur Charrington there playing Muggins, who is uh, about to get <laughs> is convinced to join the military and take the Queen's shilling and uh, Anita Marsh plays his girl uh, Dave Aylott the director himself you'll see uh, later on make a, a cameo as the uh, the publican and apparently the 4th Essex Regiment is playing the soldiers but again look at these guys I mean these probably really are British soldiers compare them to the healthy robust looking Americans on the previous thing nothing personal lots of British friends but uh, these guys look British the uniforms See any epaulets? No. Uh, these uniforms are correct. Looks like uh, they may be out on a rock quarry again. But uh, but still, this was again a, a very popular early British film. Inspired several Muggins sequels uh, through the teens, which Arthur Charrington uh, played Muggins in. It was also one of the films in the first program, I believe, of the British Film Society that was formed by John Grierson and, and others. And, the late 20s, and uh, it, it, it just is one that I believe has survived, uh, Prince at the BFI and in, in other places, survived very well, but uh, probably not that many Americans had, had seen it until <laughs> its inclusion here uh, in 1953 in this, in this documentary. I um, guess we should say a little bit about the music and the special effects, which actually, or the sound effects on special effects, are actually pretty good. Um, the music here is, the accompaniment fits everything here, not not too annoyingly, and it, you're not even picking on Jess. Uh, you know, his narration is not that intrusive. Uh, and is sometimes reasonably entertaining, even if it is frequently incorrect. But as we said, he is most likely uh, reading <laughs> reading this off of who, who, whoever wrote it for him. You do see that the uh, many of the prints here, these were obviously preserved from positives. Uh, a lot of damage, uh, just wear and tear, nitrate damage. But again... Uh, 50s, we're, we're talking. Uh, film preservation was, even as a concept, just really uh, <laughs> starting to uh, to make inroads. You know, the, uh, the Museum of Modern Art and the East George Eastman House, George Eastman House, I don't think it was just it was just forming in the early 50s. And British Film Institute, but. Uh, Yep, uh, I think that's Dave A. Lott there playing the, uh, yep, playing the Republican with the uh, sideburns. But uh, a nice place. Now this this next one, a Matador's Love. Uh, we're we're back to our regular uh, misidentification here. This film was not produced in Spain in the early 1900s. It is once again French. In fact, apparently nobody was sharp-eyed enough to notice a unmustached Max Linder <laughs> sitting there playing the uh, the Spaniard on the right. Uh, it's it's an early uh, Linder dramatic performance. 
And uh, what the film is, in fact, is La Morte du Toreador, or uh, English title, A Drama in Seville, Pathé Frères 19 I said, Linder did make uh, quite a number of dramatic supporting roles. Very few of these survive. Again, this is a film I don't know to actually exist in another form outside of this, whether it exists in the Henry Fisher collection now or not. I, I am not positive. But, uh, oh, Linder's just getting some abuse. We're obviously kind of going the Carmen route here. Looks like we have the uh, lady who's into bullfighters who has just saved Mr. Linder's bacon. Now, in, in a few minutes, we are going to see some bullfighting scenes, which may have been shot in uh, Spain. Spain's a lot closer to France <laughs> than, uh, you know, that's, that, that, that's basically just a location jaunt, of course, so uh, uh, that is entirely possible. And, uh, and Max Linder himself later made a comedy in Spain in 1914 called Max Toreador uh, when he was doing basically a European tour and went through Spain and they uh, get actually get some real footage of him up in front of a in the bullring, uh, doing some bullfighting, and uh, in fact, actually kills the bull, <laughs> which <laughs> I don't know. Somehow, it just kind of loses sympathy for a comedian to see him actually, uh, you know, killing a uh, a live animal. But uh, yeah, here's some here's some footage. This this does look authentic. Seville, perhaps, who knows? But uh, probably Spain. And back to footage probably in the Paris studios with Max Linder. Yeah, we don't get any actual close shots of the bullfighter. So he's probably somebody doubling. You know, a real bullfighter doubling for the actor playing the bullfighter. But uh, I said soon after this Linder got into making comedies and uh, so just amazingly amazingly uh, wonderful uh, not always very sophisticated uh, Max Linder comedies you can see him doing things like vomiting into a policeman's helmet and uh, <laughs> you know, other strange things but but for the most part a sophisticated more worldly type of comedy which uh, again influenced Chaplin influenced uh, a, a number of people, including comics like Charlie Chase and Raymond Griffith. But uh, here, again, playing a, a dramatic role. Okay, this next one. Uh, not only does, does Jessel and Company not even get close to what it actually is, um, this one stumped quite a number of... Uh, my fellow historians and, uh, and and myself included for quite some time. Um, they call it Nell and the Bandit, uh, and say it's an East Coast production. Actually, it doesn't necessarily look like an East Coast production. It may have been a West Coast production, or it may have been shot somewhere like you know, Colorado. We're not completely positive. Uh, Nell and the Bandit. Uh, I think they call it Ramona's the Bandit in the uh, in the British uh, compilation Return Fair to Laughter. But uh, the first of the three actors in this that anybody recognized was the actress, who is in fact Bessie Eaton, which is <laughs> was the first stumper because everybody immediately thought it's got to be a Selig picture because all the known Bessie Eaton credits were Selig films. She worked for them from 1912 to about 1918, 1919. But uh, nothing with this plot uh, or these other two actors could be could be figured out. And Ramona's The Bandit, again, was, was a stumper for quite a while. Now, the sheriff who is about to show up... <laughs> Bob Burchard, a uh, film story now in California, uh, thought he recognized him as Charles K. French, who uh, 
was a, was a fine actor in the early silent days, appeared in the uh, first Cecil B. DeMille uh, feature film, um, The Squaw Man, uh, 1913, shot out in California. But again, Charles K. French didn't work for Sea Leg. So it came down to figuring out who Ramones or whatever the bandit's name was. And that, that took some digging. Who Ramones, in fact, is, is Joseph de Grasse, who um, is brother of Sam de Grasse, who's an uh, actor who played a lot of villains in the uh, silent uh, in the 20s, uh, the name a little more recognizable. Uh, the de Grasse brothers, all Canadian. Uh, by the fact, Joseph was born in Bathurst, New Brunswick, Canada, May 4th, 1873. He died in Eagle Rock, California, May 25th, 1940. Uh, he was known way more as a director. He did not make that many pictures. And in fact, uh, then uh, we really only spotted him from looking at some B-Westerns where he played supporting roles as an older fellow in the 30s. What this turned out to be was not Selig, but American Pathé. The picture is The Sheriff's Daughter. Pathé American released March 18, 1911. And it was David Keene at the Niles Film Museum, Niles Esne Film Museum in Niles, California, who dug and dug and dug and turned up <laughs> that information. This last large clip, this is a 1912 Calum short called Into the Jungle. Uh, very actually, this one was, was pretty easy. I figured this one out very quickly. The uh, the jealous fellow, the odd man out of the triangle, is an actor named Stuart Holmes. <laughs> uh, the, the other two actors are actually Tom Moore, who yeah. plays the the other lover, and the lovey is Lottie Pickford, Mary Pickford's sister, which uh, made this pretty easy to triangulate. Stuart Holmes, of course, again, great old character actor. Um, Born in Chicago, March 10th, 1884. Real name Joseph Liebchen. And this, this store worked forever. I mean, he starts about 1909 and worked into the 60s. You know, into, I think, you know, one of his, his last uncredited appearance as a bit player in seven days in May in 1964. And he may have worked after that. He died in 1971 out in Hollywood. Uh, you saw him in, I mean, he played everything. Villains to romantic leads, some famous films he appeared in, Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, uh, Prisoner of Zenda, Rex Ingram liked him, apparently, Under Two Flags. He's in Three Weeks. Probably best remembered today uh, for playing Lord Dirimar in The Man Who Laughs. But silent comedy buffs like, like I uh, remember him in how works things like Dog Shy with Charlie Chase, Scared Stiff, Should Tall Men Marry. He was a good comedian. Now, by the way, the the mother whom <laughs> George describes as thinking it was a man is not a man. In fact, it's Alison Skipworth, a fine old British character actress, um, really more stage actress. She just made a few uh, early silence at Calum. This of course, being shot down in Jacksonville, Florida, where Calum had, uh, had built the studio. But it, it is, it's one of her few silent appearances. And uh, most people think of her, you know, much older. She made pictures with uh, W.C. Fields, kind of almost teamed with W.C. Fields for a while. And If I Had a Million, and Tilly and Gus, and uh, Six of a Kind. Uh, it's a great character lady, even starred in some pictures. Great one called Madame Racketeer, uh, where she's a con woman, uh, 1932. Just delightful, delightful actress. Died in uh, 1952 in New York, I think went back to the stage. Here's the swamps of Jacksonville filling in for Africa as old Stewart goes wandering. Now, Tom Moore, of course, was one of the Famous Moore brothers, brother of Owen Moore and Matt Moore, both actors. Owen Moore married to Mary Pickford. Uh, so Matt Moore was really kind of in the family. He, he and Lottie Pickford, I think, were down here working. Matt Moore married several famous actresses, including Alice Joyce, uh, to, whom he met working at Calum. He, he was a, a leading man at Calum uh, from... Oh boy, about 1912 uh, until 1914, 1915. He started a biograph, D.W. Griffith. Uh, divorced Alice Joyce in 1920, married Renee Adderay. He was married to her for several years. Uh, divorced her in 1924. 
again, the Moore brothers all tended to work. I'm not sure because they were related and friends with Mary Pickford or whatever, but they just worked forever. A good, solid, stalwart, leading men. Uh, like I said, after working for Kalen for a number of years, he became a Tom Moore became a Goldwyn star in the late teens, early 20s, and then pretty much like <laughs> his two brothers freelanced busily throughout the uh, 20s. There's Allison Skipworth again <laughs> greeting the uh, the now armless. Didn't you love the saw sound effect? I thought that was that was kind of vulgar, uh, but great. Uh, again, things we might remember Tom Moore now, The Clinging Vine with Leatrice Joy, Manhandled with Gloria Swanson. Lottie Pickford, of course, uh, never had the career her sister had. Uh, she worked all over, Biograph, Imp, Calum, Majestic, was a supporting actress in the late teens, then pretty much worked uh, in uh, various relatives like Douglas Fairbanks, Mary Pickford's pictures in the 20s. She's in Dorothy Byrne of Hannon Hall. I think her last credit's Don Q, Son of Zorro. The United Artists here. Um, what we're seeing now are just some, some odd, neat clips. This Marie Dressler clip, in fact, is the opening of Tilly's Punctured Romance, which you didn't see much until, you know, the recent restoration. John Gilbert in the show. This is some newsreel footage of Rudolph Valentino, uh, after he had come back from Europe in 1924-25, uh, you get a nice picture, not wearing makeup, of his scar on his right cheek, and uh, yeah, the beard they got rid of pretty quick. George Arliss looks like also probably coming across on the boat. This is indeed George Fitzmaurice, Ronald Coleman, and Blanche Sweet. This is Lon Chaney and Mr. Wu. Just some, some nice little close-ups from some films that really weren't available in the 50s. Uh, Clara Bow, the It Girl, actually from It. <laughs> Which is amazing. There's uh, Dolores Del Rio. I think that's from Evangeline from 1929. Eddie Cantor. Hey, just so got that one correct. That is from Special Delivery, which was a Paramount picture directed by Roscoe Arbuckle with gags by Larry Seaman. Uh, at the time, I think thought to be a missing picture. Marion Davies and I think Janice Meredith. I think that's that's what's that from Harold Lloyd, Hot Water, 1924, with Jupina Ralston, uh, Josephine Crowell, and Charles Stevenson in the backseat playing uh, mother and brother-in-law. Here's Pola Negri from Barbed Wire, 1928. Uh, Tom Mix, and I guess that's Tony. Uh, they say it is. That looks like a Sea Lake picture, though. That looks like an early one. And this tends to be the Chaplin clip we always got, especially in this period. This is Charles Chaplin and Max Wayne from his trysting place, or places, depending on uh, <laughs> where you read it. But I think that's a typo that still confuses the historians. But uh, this eating sequence is, uh, A, it was public domain, and it was generally available at the time. So when you, when you needed Chaplin in this period, amazing for 1953, considering Chaplin had been recently exiled, but we're still getting some uh, Chaplin footage in this. Again, not, not the greatest of quality. The Keystones were reissued endlessly. Footage from the New York Hat. Yeah, we got that right. Lionel Barrymore, Mary Pickford. This footage is not in Return Fair to Laughter. I think this this was probably put together. This is why they thank the Motion Picture Academy. And I think this is Manhattan Madness with Douglas Fairbanks. It appears to be 1918. Artcraft picture. But uh, I'm, I'm sure that, uh, you know, everybody... You know, the American producers thought we'd better have a few more <laughs> recognizable American stars, even though, again, what we've seen was all rather rare footage at the time. Now we're seeing uh, one of the Raytone reissue titles for the uh, Walt Disney Alice cartoons. These are actually available from VCI in those Raytone reissues. Kit Parker, VCI, and the Alice in Cartoon Land series. Uh, but, of course, those uh, sound reissues did manage to preserve some of the uh, Alice cartoons. And, and they're not bad. The tracks are, are, are not bad at all. It's interesting that they've cut all the live-action Alice footage out of this. I guess they want to, they want to make this look 
as close to Disney as possible. And of course, these films weren't controlled by Walt Disney. They, uh, Margaret Winkler had uh, released them and owned them, and somewhere in that had, had sold them to Ray Johnstone, who reissued them in those Raytone uh, talky, you know, sound reissues with uh, with new scores. The uh, cat looks very dangerously like Felix the cat, you know. So I think uh, even Uncle Walt was uh, <laughs> sort of walking the uh, copyright tightrope <laughs> there on uh, character. But then all the cats and cartoons of the 20s tended to look like Felix, just in the same way the mice <laughs> in the 30s tended to look like Mickey Mouse, no matter who was doing them. But uh, even getting the, uh, the patented Disney butt joke. Somebody, some historian, that was always the type of every Disney cartoon, there is a butt joke. But then again, in, in most of the early Chaplin films, there are also butt jokes. I think butt jokes tended to be another movie industry standard. But, uh, some nice newsreel footage. Sadly silent of Will Rogers, uh, at least silent here, it's actually sound footage, I think uh, Fox Movie Tone uh, footage of Will Rogers at the Democratic Convention, and that pretty much wraps up uh, all the, the rare footage in, uh, in this picture. Now as, was, as George Jessel comes over and does a little tribute to Al Jolson, who of course had passed away in 1950, and once again reminds us, I, I could have been in the jazz singer, I could have done it, you know, if it hadn't been for me, Jolson wouldn't be a star, and of course, he proves to us, see, I, I, I can do to to Tootsie too, nah. anyway, that pretty much wraps up all of the, uh, the rare and interesting film clips, and uh, we need to acknowledge a few people, you know, any any time any of us go on a research adventure like this, nobody does it alone. And I, I do have to thank <laughs> some wonderful folk who have uh, helped me in the last few weeks, crazily trying to figure out what these films are. Uh, number one, Mr. Zoran Sinabad of the Library of Congress, who uh, madly dug through motion picture worlds and Pathé catalogs and reviews to, uh, to help figure out what some of these Pathé pictures were. And uh, Mr. Steve Massa at the New York Public Library a, and a fellow member of the Silent Comedy Mafia who, same thing, would uh, get these, these odd emails from me saying, find me a review of the President's special. Tell me if this is what it is. And he would, uh, with the New York Public Library at your fingertips, that's kind of a nice resource. He would madly dig and find out. And... Uh, some of my friends and fellow compatriots uh, across the pond in England, Mr. Glenn Mitchell, uh, Mr. David Wyatt, Mr. Patrick Stanbury, Mr. Kevin Brownlaw, and Mr. Luke McKernan, who all helped uh, fill in some of the information regarding certainly the Butcher's Film Service compilations and uh, some of the odd British things, and even helped us madly try to figure out what the heck the, the last cartridge really was. <laughs> in America, many others. Chris Snowden of uh, Unknown Video and uh, Mr. David Keene, as said earlier, at the Niles SNA Film Museum in Niles, Niles, California. A wonderful place which everybody should go visit because it really is like stepping back into the past. Uh, other uh, friends in the silent comedy mafia, Mr. Paul Gorecki, Mr. Rob Farr, Mr. Robert S., Burchard, uh, my uh, better half and significant other, Ms. Linda M. Shaw, formerly of the Library of Congress and chairman of Slapstickon, and a great researcher in herself who helps keep the Roberts collection and Mr. Roberts functioning, and Brandy Cox at the Motion Picture Academy. And as we come to the end, and this the end is swiped right off the return fare to laughter, we say farewell. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope we uh, failed you in it. Oh, oh, my God. Oh, 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 God. Everything's falling off the, the steam.